started the recording. Excellent, thanks. So yeah, Andre, thanks for the introduction to decision diagrams. I think there's a lot of questions uh, that people A, put in the chat that I know are naturally going to come up as you start to see these decision diagrams. And so what I'd like to do now is really just start about the crux of the idea of relaxed decision diagrams, which really fuel what you can do. Because as Andre said in his slides so eloquently put, it is a little bit of madness to build an exact decision diagram for most problems. And that's not always the case, right? Because sometimes you might be interested in post-optimality analysis or something where if you have the exact decision diagram, even for a small problem, that's helpful, right? But when you're trying to solve a more larger scale problem or coming up with some more generic way of addressing problems, I think it is important to think about what a relaxed decision diagram is and more generally an approximate decision diagram. But we'll, we'll get through what we can. So. Um, I think this is like really what brought decision diagrams into the capability of solving problems. And I think it was probably first introduced um, in the in constraint programming, right? Which is what we're going to be talking. I mean, we, this is a constraint programming winter school. I'll talk a little bit about that. And I think, you know, it was really the replacement of the domain store by a decision diagram that is a relaxed decision diagram. It wasn't really called that then, although it was understood to be a relaxed decision diagram. And that's really where it started. And we'll talk about exactly what that is a little bit later on. Um, and the way that we generally think about decision diagrams that are relaxed is that we want to build a diagram that somehow approximates the true decision diagram, i.e. set of solutions that you'll have to a problem, but is limited in size. And how can you limit the size? There's various ways of doing that. One of the more natural ways is to say that any layer will not exceed a given threshold that you predefine or that you kind of adjust as you're building a diagram. And so that's what we're going to do is we're going to try to build decision diagrams that are not allowed to grow too large, but still somehow provide us information. And a relaxed DD is uh, probably the most important way of approximating it. And there's three uh, conditions that we want to satisfy. The first is that you do not lose a solution. So what you want to do is you want to build a decision diagram that provides a super set to the fed set of feasible solutions. And let's just talk about binary programs right now, because you may ask, does one exist? And for binary programs or really for the general problem that we're working on here that Andre put on one of the initial slides where you just have bounded integers as the feasibility set for the variables, you can think about that that always exists. Start from the root to the terminal, one zero arc, one zero arc, one zero arc, one zero arc. There are two of the n solutions there if you have n problem variables, but I can guarantee you that you haven't lost a solution, right? So the existence of a relaxed decision diagram is no problem. We know it. You want to make it a little bit of a tighter representation by allowing some kind of branching, but we'll get to that in a moment. The longest path should provide a bound on the optimal solution value. So if you have not lost a solution and you have a linear objective function in the definition of the variables that you have in the initial problem, then this is quite easy to guarantee. But when you have a nonlinear problem, it gets a bit complicated. But nonetheless, the goal is that when you take a longest path, if you're maximizing, that value will be a bound on the optimal solution. Another thing that's ideal is that the strength of the bound can be parameterized. And I think what we're trying to say here is that the larger you make this diagram, the better the bound can become. Anything else to add here, Andre? Okay. So let's talk about an example, because I think that's helpful. Here we have a decision diagram, which represents a problem by with, with four variables, each layer again is a variable. And then you have the arc values, which will represent your objective function. And here, for whatever problem this came for, if this is the exact decision diagram, we know that each path represents a solution and every solution is represented by a path. The width of this diagram is three. The first layer has one node, that's the root. The second layer has two nodes. The third layer has three nodes. Fourth layer, two nodes. Fifth layer, two nodes. Last layer, sorry, fourth layer, two nodes, last layer, one node. And the width is the maximum size of any one of those layers. And the longest path is a 12, which you can see by going down the left-hand side and then taking that one arc. And that would be, if this was an exact decision diagram, the optimal solution to your problem. What you see on the right is a relaxed decision diagram. And what it represents is a superset 
of the feasible solutions and one in which when I look at the longest path, I still get a valid bound. It's a smaller diagram, right? Every layer is restricted to only two nodes. And if I take the longest path here, it would be the path on the left and then taking that eight arc over there. And it provides a bound on your objective value. What's really interesting, I think, about decision diagram relaxations is that it provides a completely different perspective on what a relaxation can be. Generally speaking, when we're you know thinking in the MIT world, we think about relaxations as relaxations to a continuous space of your variables. This is a discrete relaxation. So it contains infeasible solutions, which basically in a MIT model we never have, except for when we're relaxing the domains to be within some range, if you're talking about discrete problems. But nonetheless, it does provide a valid relaxation because if I have a superset of solutions and find the best one there, it has to be a bound on the objective function. Any questions thus far? I think you, you, the, 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 the one arc should be taken here on the relaxation. You have a question so far? Okay, uh, so Dave, is PITA yeah. a good intuition to keep in mind for what type of relaxation this is? Can you further elaborate on the question? Uh, so I guess uh, my point was sort of, you keep the feasible solutions, but you approximate the objective value so in, in that sense. Yes, right. and so, yeah, go ahead, Andre, if you wanna. If you wanna so PITA is, you're operating on the primal space, right? In that you, you are going to get a, a you know, a polynomial scheme that you're going to still get a feasible solution, usually by, you know, you take the loads, for example, separating buckets in the case of knapsack. But in that case, you're going to always have a primal solution in the case of pitas, right? And here we are relaxed in terms of bounds. So what I would say is that it is connected within a dual space in that we are doing an approximation of the object function value by doing this breaking down into the buckets like this into the nodes that represents the solutions that end up to a node. Does, does, that, does that make sense? It is a good intuition. It actually, it's one of the open questions of the uh, how you can map, for example, uh, this polynomial time approximation schemes with the decision diagram relaxations that we get. And we also, Dave's gonna talk later on about restrictions, which is more, it's a bit closely connected to the PETAS case, okay? But it's a perfect uh, way of thinking about it. Yep. I think there was maybe another question. Okay, okay, good. So yeah, I mean, what? so I guess the question is why would that ever work? Um, and what we do know, at least computationally, is that redact relaxed DDs can prove optimality, often are gonna be several orders of magnitude smaller than what an exact decision diagram would look like. And actually, it's very simple to create a relaxed decision diagram that provides exactly the same bound if it's a linear optimization problem for the problem that you have, really kind of ignoring feasibility in some sense. But the idea is that the relaxed CDs can be quite small and still provide really, really good bounds. And we've had this for a lot of different applications, job shop scheduling, multi-knapsack problems, TSPs and TSPs with time windows, but other applications as well. Um, and if you want to think about this in a way, often only a small portion of the DD certifies the longest path. And so if you look at just one segment of a decision diagram, you often are able to get the, the information that then gives you the bound, right? As long as you relax in an effective way to exploit the fact that only the longest path is gonna give you the bound that you receive from the decision diagram. Andre, anything to add here? Yes, it's, uh... You know, you can think, of, we're going to talk about this later, but you can think that in normality, if you think about LP, only some of the constraints could be tight. So you actually don't need a lot of all the possible values of the states to actually find the optimal solution. So usually it's still something that we are understanding better. Usually some of the paths, you just need to merge some of the paths and maintain some of them accurate. Yeah, for example, if you just ignored some of the constraints and you build the exact decision diagram, which we're going to talk about in a second, you actually get a relaxation bound as well, right? And as long as those are the tight constraints, you're probably gonna get a pretty good bound. Okay, now how do we relaxed 
decision diagrams effectively? So how I think the, the real question is, how do you build them in an effective manner, both in terms of the bound that you get and also in the time it takes you to achieve that bound? And nobody really knows this answer very well. Uh, the answer is, you know, you, you, you relax it in the way that works for the specific problem that you have. But it's just like, how do you attack a MIP problem in the best way? Well, you have to tailor specific cuts for it. And that I think is kind of like the way to think about it. There are many different ways that you can build a relaxed decision diagram. Um, and there's really two major relaxation mechanisms which we're gonna to go to. And they're based on generic properties that you can ensure that a relaxation is valid. And you can actually formalize this, but let's just talk about specifically how one might build a relaxed decision diagram. Node merging is one way that I have found to be particularly effective for combinatorial optimization problems. And what you do is during the top-down compilation, which we've already talked about, you're gonna merge nodes and replace their states in a way that ensures that you're never gonna throw away throw away any feasible solutions. As an example for Knapsack, suppose that you have some state and you know that you've already used 15 units of a knapsack. If I were to now just say that, well, actually from this node, I'm gonna allow myself to pretend as if I've only used 14 units of weight and I continue growing it, of course, I'm never gonna throw away any solutions. And so this gives you an idea of what a relaxation might look like as far as the operation that you use to merge different nodes. So for our knapsack example, to more specifically talk about something, suppose we fix a width limit of two. Let's build it for the example that we had. So we start from the root, we go to the zero, and then we go to the one. This state again will represent how much of the knapsack weight you have taken up to that point. When we go down to the third layer, we see that you know we can't really merge any nodes here. At least we can't see that we can merge any nodes here because the information that we have in the state is different. And on any layer of a decision diagram, when you're building it top down, I like to think about the state as breaking the nodes into equivalence classes. And the better and more refined the state is, the fewer equivalence classes that you get. But as long as it breaks it down into equivalence classes so that when you do merge, you don't lose any information, you're perfectly in fair game. But here we're in a situation where we just cannot merge any nodes, at least based on the information that we see at this point, but we want to make sure that we do not exceed a width of two. And that can be because of time or space considerations. So what do we do? Well, what we can do is we can pick any two nodes, really, and define a relaxation operation. And this depends on the specific application you're talking about. But for knapsack problems, as I told you before, if I were to lower the state value at any node, I'm certainly not going to throw away any information if I continue building from that node and going downwards. So what we can do is pick any collection of nodes, merge them, and then adjust the state to something that will ensure that the remaining building of the decision diagram does not throw away any feasibility. And so any path ultimately that's created from the zero one arc, at least at this point has exact information, but any path that goes from the one to the zero arc has some kind of relaxed information. It's not necessarily gonna be a lot of relaxed information, but it depends on the problem and exactly which nodes you merge. Merging node two and, mode, and node zero probably wouldn't make as much sense because then you would be losing even more information. And so, yeah, so, so here you just take the, the, the minimum load of the state that ensures all solutions are preserved. And I think that's a way of looking at it in a more generic way. But the way that I think about it is you have a problem, you have your state, you wanna make sure that you can put the states together to get another state that may not have ever actually arisen in some cases, if you would have run the DP otherwise, but it is something that could be a part of the state space, which allows you to continue building the diagram. Now, there's many questions here. One of the questions is, well, how do you define this merging operation? But even if you have that, which nodes do you merge? Because suppose that you actually allowed yourself a width of 100 and you're on some layer J, and suppose it's a binary program and you were to build every single node out and suppose there was no natural merging based on the states that you had, you would now have a decision diagram where the J plus first layer has 200 nodes 
And if you want to keep it to 100 nodes, you're going to have to figure out exactly how you break them down to merge them. And this can, of course, be the, the, the way in which you choose those, merge, those nodes to merge provides you a very different type of relaxation bound. And so figuring out which nodes to merge is a challenge. Let's look at one more example just to clarify how some states might a come to be even though they never were going to be in the state space but also how you would define it for the independent set and remember you had this eligible set of vertices that you could add to independent sets as you were growing it and here we're at a point where we actually can't merge any nodes because you have v5 here meaning you can only add vertex 5 to any independent set there v3 v4 or v5 meaning you can only add those three nodes so actually anything in the remaining graph and then v4 and v5 i can't put them in because I can't put any of these together because they don't actually have the same state, but I can pick any collection of nodes and merge them. Now, what do you think, just like Andre was asking questions, I'll quiz the group as well. What do you think would be a legitimate way of defining a merging operation here? And the way that I think about it is when I have a state, what can I do to that state to ensure that I never drop any information and then how can I take two nodes and merge them? So here we say that we can just put in V5. Here we say we can put in V3, V4, or V5. Any ideas on how I can modify these states, make them the same, collapse them together, but then ensure that I have a relaxation, meaning a superset of the feasible solutions. Okay, some chats. I love it. Someone said the union. Any other ideas? What's the opposite of the union? And you know, the intersection, but in this case, the union is absolutely correct. But we're going to think about intersection in a moment. But the union is right, right? Because and and again, I I know that's like an operation from two different states, but I almost think of it as on one state, how could I relax the information and ensure that I do not lose any information as I grow downwards? And the idea that I have is that look, this node, the left red node says I can only add vertex five to any independent set under this. And if you look at the graph on the left, you'll see why it's because you've decided to not take vertex one, but then take vertex two. So you're kind of destroying the availability of three and four. But if I never want to throw away information, if I'm going to add a vertex to this state, I'm never going to lose that. I mean, I'm definitely going to make sure that I never throw away information. So the union operation is correct here because that provides a way of expanding on both of these states and always going to allow me a way to make them equivalent so that I can build them and not lose any information. Excellent. And then you continue building it, merging as needed, and you end up with this relaxation in this case. And you can get a relaxation bound. You can do all the things you want because the longest path in this graph will necessarily give you a upper bound on your objective function because you're maximizing and because you know that you're implicitly representing a superset of the feasible solutions. Good. Any other, uh, so I know someone said in the break, most, most of I said, uh, can I ask a question regarding relaxation? Did that answer that question or do you have another question? Cause I, there are a lot of open questions here. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I have some experience, experience building them. Well, I wanted to ask whether there is a connection between uh, reducing a diagram and relaxing in a way when you are constructing them in parallel, simultaneously, something like this. Yeah, I think that's what's happening here, right? We are relaxing the problem by merging the nodes, right? And reducing the size of it while you're relaxing the information, if that answers your question. Okay, thank you. You're, you're saying that there are more equivalence classes than it should be. In a way, a redemption says, look, regardless of how I merge nodes, I'm going to be fine. I'm not going to lose any information. But here, you're saying it's fine. I'm going to allow myself to lose some information to ensure that I don't, I'm still tractable in styles. Good. Any other questions before we go on? This is the basics of relaxing. This is at least the basis of one of the methods of producing a relaxed decision diagram, which we call just top-down compilation of relaxed decision diagrams. Okay, another alternative, and actually there's probably three, but here's another alternative, which is really important because a lot of what we end up doing is 
actually this is constraint selection. So this might be one of the simplest things, but suppose you had a myth with M constraints. And suppose I take one of those constraints and I build an exact decision diagram for that constraint, meaning the objective function I can encode in the weights or I choose not to put those weights there and I just encode the uh, feasibility of that one constraint. That would be a relaxed decision diagram for the whole problem, right? It's certainly a superset of the feasible solutions. And if I were to look at it in and of itself along this path in that graph, if I do put the weights there, of course, it gives me an upper bound. So even one constraint provides me a relaxed decision diagram. So what you can do is you can look at, I don't know, this problem, take this problem where we have three variables and two constraints, simply remove one of them, build your decision diagram. And this will of course provide you an upper bound because it just ignored some of the constraints. That's perfectly fine. You get a valid relaxation. Um, and the question is, you know, we, we use this a lot and, and why does it work so well? And I go, I think it goes back to what Andre said just a few minutes ago, right? I mean, at optimality, we know that only a few constraints have to be satisfied at equality or going to be tight or even very close to tight. And so if you, if you know that x1 plus 3x2 plus 7x3 less than or equal to 9 are not going to be, is not going to be satisfied at equality at the optimal solution, then you really kind of don't have to worry about now, how do we know which ones, of course, is a hard question to answer. But still, I think that provides some intuitive understanding as to why just picking some subset of the constraints is right or, or can provide a good bound. Um, and I, I, I think what we'll argue with an example later on, and I don't know how much time we'll get to all the examples, is that there are certain types of constraints that are really not very good for decision diagrams. And there are certain type of constraints that are really very good for decision diagrams. And hopefully we'll get to some examples. So if you are able to take the constraints that are very good for decision diagrams, let the decision diagrams handle that, integrate that decision diagram into the MIP through the network flow relaxation. All of a sudden you're getting the best of both worlds because MIP can do all the cuts it wants on all the constraints it knows how to handle very well. The decision diagram is going to provide you an ideal formulation for the set of constraints that the MIP cannot handle very well. And combined together, you might get a very tight relaxation for the original problem. And you don't have to just build one decision diagram. You can build many decision diagrams, which is a particular area of research that I've really enjoyed uh, over the last couple of years. Andre, anything to add to this? As a question from Ian Zhu, does removing constraints actually lead to smaller BDDs? Absolutely. Um, you know, Andre gave the example before where you had the two knapsacks and all of a sudden the state space blows up and you're not able to, well, maybe they, there are some mergings that could happen, but it's really hard to merge them. But if you have individual constraints, decision diagrams, they're definitely going to be relatively small in size. So for example, here, when you have just binary variables and all of the coefficients are positive, and you only have less than or equal to constraints, actually the other way is the same, but suppose just we say less than or equal to, each of these in and of itself can have a width of at most the right-hand side plus one. So the exact decision diagram for the first constraint by itself will have width at most three. The exact de decision diagram for the second constraint here will have it width at most 10. And suppose we had hundred constraints, well, each one of them would have a pretty small decision diagram. However, if you were to build the decision diagram for the entire system put together, there's no way of bounding. Well, you can bound it, but it's going to be very, very large. The intersection between two decision diagrams or the union, but the intersection between two decision diagrams. What I mean by that is you have a decision diagram one, decision diagram two, and you want to produce a different decision diagram whose set of solutions are the intersection between the set of solutions in DD1 and DD2. The width of that diagram is going to be, in general, about the product of the width of the original diagrams. So you see that if you've got 100 constraints and you keep doing this, it's going to blow up and it's going to be completely intractable. But for individual constraints, at least linear inequalities, they are quite small. And sometimes even for subsets of inequalities, you can show that it's very small. So yes, the answer to your question is absolutely. Um, it can now, be smaller. To, to add to the mass, okay, yes. 
there are cases if you are uh, there are cases where adding constraints make the diagram smaller okay there are cases especially when you reduce because this is the uh, this is when, what they've said is, is like this is the diagram when you have when you add the constraints as if they are knapsacks when you reduce things can get a little bit wild because you're going to start finding more equivalence classes and then you're going to be it can be smaller so let me give you an example there is actually a phase transition where as you add constraints, the diagram starts to grow. And then you should keep adding constraints, then the diagram is going to start getting smaller. Because imagine a situation where when you have all the constraints put together, you're only going to have one feasible solution because their interaction in a way is super nonlinear where you so then the diagram is going to be just a path, right? When you have all the constraints together. When you have them separately, maybe they can be larger. So in general, any constraints, you are adding states, and then the diagram, like they've said, can blow up. But there are situations when you add more constraints that they start getting smaller because you reduce the space, you reduce the combinatorial possibilities of uh, solutions that you may get. Okay. Totally agree. So it can be both ways, right? Uh, which I think is interesting, right? But yeah, so that I hope that answers your question. Oh, we have a lot of... Uh, because of linear chief is a bit faster. Yes, Moses, exactly. You, you, you know, at more constraints, you can have less solutions. But then this the every could this could happen. It's so like a phase transition of the tightness of the bag. Yep. And uh, Aaliyah, uh, apologies if I didn't say that exactly right. I think you're asking a very nice question, right? So is there a connection between which constraints to relax when building relaxed CDs and Lagrangian relaxation. So I think the idea is that, you know, you've got some diagrams and then you have some, you know, other ones that are kind of Lagrangian. And I think, yes, absolutely. Andre, maybe you've done a little bit of work there. You can speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so when you, so suppose that you have an LP, you have the network flow model, and then you add the constraints, the additional constraints when you're filling a, a, a full map. Then, if you relax, if you dualize the constraints to the object function, you add penalties. And then what happens is you, you're going to have a longest path on the decision diagram where the arcs are going to be parameterized by your Lagrange multipliers. So there is a connection there as well with the constraints that you leave out that you can represent as duals. And you can incorporate their duals into the decision diagram. And you're going to get exactly the same bounds from Lagrangian theory from Geoffrey and everybody. So that can happen, and there's a very strong connection between them. Um, that it's there is other works that they show that the bounds. I think uh, Mateo's Juniata is here. He's working on a problem where the Lagrangian relaxation, when you incorporate both of them, Margarita Castro, one of the speakers, also used the same idea of leverage their connections with Lagrangian relaxations and the constraints that you leave out, and they they can help us build better DDs, or actually we're trying to find out, but. Uh, there are a lot of connections with like relaxations that people are exploring now. Absolutely. I Great hope question. that answered your question. Yeah. And there's more to do there, of course, but yes. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so I think this is, you know, the, the constraints that you choose to put as DDs, you know, uh, uh, can actually be very key in, in, in creating some scalable approaches using decision diagrams. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on, hopefully. Okay. Well, when are relaxations, well, I think, do we have another question here? Okay, thank you. So when are relaxations good? And uh, yeah, I remember when I was first giving even job talks, right? I would get, you know, I'd show all the decision diagrams and basically every single time the question at the end was, okay, when should you use decision diagrams? And I, I think the only answer that you can come up with is when you have a good DP model. If you, there are some problems that are naturally and effectively formulated as dynamic programs. And I think when you have that kind of a recursive way of thinking about the problem, you're going to get a really nice relaxation. But when it doesn't exist, it becomes a little bit harder. Um, things like sequencing problems, binary quadratic formulations, independent sets, although they haven't been that explored because we focus generally on MIPS, you do have some really nice kind of DP flavor to it. And of course, sequencing problems, if you think about it, right, you're thinking about an ordering. So you already have kind of like a way of viewing the problem as a sequential decision problem. And as we showed with the independent set, you can also do that. Binary quadratic formulations are also very, very interesting. We won't have time today to go into that, but you can look at some of our papers. 
there are definitely problems that are really, really, really not very good. As an example, matching problems. So if you build a decision diagram for a matching problem, it just blows up. MIP handles it so well because of total modularity and all this stuff. The DD just does not do that well. So if you have a matching style problem, you know, it is just more amenable to a linear formulation. And why that's the case is because the problem naturally is handled better through that type of system. And I think it's, it's, it's a question of whether you can solve a matching problem effectively with DDs. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, it's just exponential, even though the problem is easy. So I find that super interesting also. You can have a problem that's polynomially solvable and the decision diagram is gonna be polynomial in size. But of course, there's gonna be problems that are polynomially solvable, but have exponential decision diagrams, no matter what variable ordering you choose. And so there's also kind of some very interesting complexity problems that you get and matching problems are just one of the, one of those type of problems. And I think when I first started out, I was trying to solve quadratic assignment problems using DDs because, you know, they're relatively small and they're really hard. I, I, I don't know if anyone here has tried that before. I don't see a way of doing it yet, um, but maybe there's some, some ways of doing it. Anything to say to that, Andre, or do you think that covers it? Excellent. Okay, so we talked about relaxation and bounding. That's great. But what about when we get to search and solution methods? Because, okay, we have a bounding mechanism. Now, how do you actually use it to solve a problem? And you can solve it using the bounds, but also as a search-based mechanism. So can you use DDs for branching purposes? Absolutely. I mean, really, it's kind of a compact representation of a relaxation, if you're using relaxed DDs, of the entire branching tree that you might get if you were to solve it by MIP, but of the entire branching tree. And so, of course, there's some type of a relationship there, right? Because you're, you're doing some kind of partial enumeration, right? And so there is definitely a connection with how you can branch. And we might go back to this theme of symmetry a lot, uh, but yeah, I mean, you can definitely leverage the symmetry that's re revealed by relaxed decision diagrams in order to understand where you can branch and how you can branch. And we'll talk about that now. And the idea that we're gonna use is not only to use the decision diagram for the search mechanism, but also to replace other type of relaxations. Now, there are many ways of building relaxations for problems, right? It's not just LP or decision diagrams. There's tons of ways. The most classical thing, of course, is to use LP relaxations. And if you have a MIP or a discrete optimization problem, most of the time, the natural thing that comes to optimizers on how you're going to solve that problem is branch and bound. But it's really LP-based branch and bound, right? That's the solution method we typically use. But you can also do DD-based branch and bound, which I'll show in the next couple slides. You get the relaxation value from the relaxed decision diagram, and you get the way that you decompose the space in order to do the search from the nodes of the diagram when you are building them. Let's look at this independent set problem and let's look at this relaxed decision diagram that we have on the left. This is an independent set problem on six nodes. If you were to build the exact decision diagram, the width of the exact decision diagram is four. And suppose that for memory limits or time limits, you wanted to restrict yourself to width three. So that's what you would get on the left in the relaxed decision diagram that you see. As you're building this diagram, suppose you are in using some kind of top-down compilation method, okay? There's gonna be a point at which you've never had to make a improper decision to merge nodes. Now, almost surely, eventually you have to merge nodes, but at some point, you know that you have exact information. And although you might not be able to produce this black decision diagram, the blue decision diagram, you know that up to that layer three, it's definitely the same thing because you haven't caused any merging just to keep the, the width down to a certain level. And so there must be an optimal solution that necessarily passes through these nodes. And, and quite frankly, if you cut the node, if you, if you find any way of cutting the root in the terminal, the optimal solution has to pass through one of the nodes in that cut of the root in the terminal. But it is natural or at least very useful to find a layer, the last exact layer we call it, but you can also use an exact cut set and other, other ideas, where you look at the last layer that you built, well, really the first layer that you built, that did not do any forceful mergings. 
and you know that it's exact up to that point and then an optimal solution has got to pass through one of those nodes. So this is what you would get in the top-down compilation method for this particular problem up to this layer. And so you know that, well, uh, you're gonna have to go through one of these nodes and you can also calculate what is going to be your solution up to this point and also what your optimal value is moving forward. So in the left node, we haven't taken any vertices. So the current independent set size is zero. The middle one, it's one. And the second one, it's also one because you see only one, one arc on the paths leading to that node. Now what you can do is you can recursively solve the problem on each one of these portions of the problem. And if you remember what the state is being the eligible set of vertices, the right node here is what you get as your state when you take node one and then don't take node two. Your only real option left is to take node three or six. If I were to build the decision diagram for the independent set problem, only on the graph induced by the state, okay, the best you can do is one more node. We know that because, well, they're connected by an edge and you're looking for an independent set. So if I take the one, which is the value of the longest path up to this node, and I add one, which is the length of the longest path in this diagram, I get what the best possible solution is that goes through this node. You can do that recursively for both this dark blue, the brown, and the red. And the best solution has got to be the best one that's contained in any one of those. Furthermore, suppose that here I were to build a relaxed decision diagram, one that potentially contains a superset of the set of feasible solutions on the graph induced by vertex three and six. Well, the only solution that it might also add is a one and a one, meaning take both three and six. Note that one, which is the length of the path from the root to here, plus two, which would be the relaxed value if you were to include that solution, three, is still a valid relaxation for any solution that would arise from paths that go through this node in the exact decision diagram. So again, you see that you've really decomposed your space and you can build recursively relaxations all the way down. So we use the decision diagram to provide bounds on each node. And we also can decompose the problem by looking at the problems of the graphs induced by each one of these nodes on the way down. Any questions up to that point? Because this is, you know, this was the original thing that we really use decision diagrams for, right? A complete search, a complete solution mechanism to discrete or really binary optimization problems mostly uh, by using the decision diagram, both for branching and for bounding. Anything to add there, Andre? No, uh, another way of thinking, I think as, as if you are lazily generating the diagram. So you build a diagram onto a layer, then you take one of the nodes, generate the diagram there. And then you find the best solution for that particular nodes, you throw that node away, and then you do this one node at a time. And because you're just building the diagrams individually, you don't need to explore the whole search space at once, right? The trade-off is that you're not going to find the reductions in the solution space later on, but still you, you're, you have memories much more controlled. And then you're arranging on the nodes. So you see, if you're arranging a node, all the paths that end up the nodes, which can be many, you don't need to explore all the variable value assignments separately because all of them are contained in that state. The state has, the node has enough information to summarize everything that happened up to that node. Correct, you need the value of the longest path up to that node and the state, and you can solve the problem. And if you also want the solution, you only have to record one of the solutions that ends at this node. Now I know we only have one for each one of these nodes, but regardless, you would only have to record one of them that achieves the length of the longest path up to that node. Awesome. Okay, uh, can this ever be effective, right? That's the question. You can come up with an algorithm, but the question is, can this work? Here is a, it's just a collection of uh, experiments that we had. I mean, there, you know, you can see some, look, it's not always gonna be as good as MIP, okay? But in this case, in a couple of years back, comparing with CPLEX, we generated, you know, a collection of random instances. I guess this was just Eridos Rainey graphs, if I remember correctly. But anyway, some kind of collection of random instances with particular densities, 500 variables. And you can see that the BDD 
leaves, generally speaking, a much better average percent gap at the time of whatever the timeout was for these experiments. C plus is the green line, BDDs are the blue line. For very sparse graphs, the and not very sparse graphs, I should just say for sparse graphs, the C plus was actually much better. But I think as it gets dense, if you think about the state information, right, you're recording the set of eligible vertices. So if I pick a node that has a lot of neighbors in the graph, the next state that I create on the next layer is going to be very, very small, meaning I can only add a couple nodes there. And that's when some kind of a, a deep dive search, like a decision diagram can work better than a MIP model because it is kind of an easier kind of enumeration type of a problem than it is with solving linear relaxations and all the, all the LP based machinery that we have. Good. So that's towards a solution approach. Uh, and we now have a couple of the ingredients that one might need for an optimization approach. You have a way of creating relaxations. You have a way of branching, which is a little bit different than what you typically do in a MIP style solution approach. The only other thing that we want to add here, or at least one thing that we want to add here, is primal methods, meaning how can I actually find feasible solutions? Because so far it's all been about bounds. Um, yeah, how do you, I see that question. So how do you set the width? Um, ah, well, it depends. Yeah, I don't, I don't have the answer there. Um, I think it's experimentation, right? I, I think uh, it's really, it's sort of an open question. Can you find some like actually good heuristic way of deciding what your width is going to be? And, you know, we, there are some times where if you're doing a branch and bound, setting the width to two is super effective. Just because the bounds are quite good already. So the speed that you get is good. But there are some problems where you really need the flexibility of the width to provide yourself a reasonable bound that can actually provide some pruning in the search space. So I think, you know, I, I, I don't really have the answer there, Andre. I don't know if you have any kind of a, a different way of looking at it. For me, it's mostly experimentation for the particular application. Yeah, I, I agree with Dave, most experimentation. From my experience, there are usually two situations that happen. If you need to operate a lot with the same diagram, different ways, build a lot of them, like they've said, sometimes small width is what you need because you need to operate a lot of them. Uh, once I have to build a diagram one time because I need to compute the flow of that diagram, so I just build it once. And so, and I don't need it, I just need to compute some combinatorial over, over the diagram. So then I just, you know, David and I, we, we do have a server where we run experiments with 120 gigabytes of RAM. I just use 126 gigabytes and the remaining two gigabytes for the other process. So I built this 2 billion node diagram. So it really depends on how often you need to, what type of operations, what is the complexity of the operations that you need to run the diagram. If you need to run a network flow model of the diagram, then we would say if you have uh, more than 10 million nodes Guru B and Ciplex, and they start to, to have some issues solving even the that the LP. So it just depends on the complexity of the operations that you're running with that. But that's my usual idea. Yep. But it's a good question. And you know, it's it really, I think, yeah, depends on the use, kind of like Andre is saying as well. Okay, let's talk about primal methods. Um, just to make sure that. I thought that always more, well, more width is better. So it's a great point that you're bringing, right? Suppose you're solving a MIP, okay? Are more cuts better than fewer cuts? The answer is yes, if you want a good bound, right? I mean, it may not get any better, but it certainly is not gonna get worse if you add more cutting planes. But if you want an effective scalable approach, are more cuts better? It sort of depends, right? I mean, at some point it's better to branch because search is more important than betting in the bound better. But it's, yeah, it's a great question. Okay. So let's talk very briefly about um, um, restricted decision diagrams, uh, which are analogous to relaxed ones, except they work in the opposite way. So the idea is either to merge or remove nodes if the width is too large. And it's super scalable uh, and really, really good for large scale problems. And I kind of think of restricted decision diagrams 
as a way of generalizing greedy heuristics. And let me show you why I think that, okay? Let's take the independent set problem, okay? So here you have a solution. I believe this is the, this is not the maximum independent set. This is a heuristic solution, right? Take nodes one and node five. I could have taken nodes two and seven, two and five, and it's a better solution, but there's a solution, okay? If I look at the diagram on the right, it is a restricted decision diagram in the sense that it doesn't contain any infeasible solutions, but you are missing feasible solutions. Okay. Now you might say to yourself, okay, I can't get a relaxation bound. And I'll say, correct. You can't get a, a relaxation bound from this. But if you know that every single solution here is feasible, that means if I take the longest path or if I take any path, it's a feasible solution to my problem. And in particular, if you want the tightest bound that you can get from the restricted decision diagram that you have, solve a longest path problem, take that path, and you have a lower bound in the case of maximization for your optimization problem. And here you see the solution that you get. Now, how do you build that? There's two different ways. And I don't think I can talk specifically about either of them right now. One of the ways is to create a different operator like you have for the relaxations where we took the union if you took the intersection. Because if you take the intersection, for example, for the independent set problem, you're just looking at a smaller graph. Now, of course, you might throw away solutions, but at least you're getting something. Another way of thinking about it is a greedy heuristic. If you think about this, suppose that I was building the decision diagram. I just threw away nodes whenever I got too big. The way that I would choose the nodes to throw away is potentially through some type of heuristic that provides me some understanding of what my potential benefit might be. And actually, a restricted decision diagram with one can be thought of as a, the way that you build it by just throwing away nodes can be thought of it as just doing a simple greedy heuristic because you can say, okay, when I started the node, for example, for the independent set problem, you might choose a node that has the smallest neighborhood and maybe one that has the highest value. So node five is the natural choice. So your really choices, if you were to build the exact decision diagram and started with node five would be to either exclude it or include it. Well, I would probably want to include it and then you throw away this node. And so then you just have one node going down, but that's just like a greedy heuristic for the problem. So any choice of greedy heuristic can be thought of as the building of a decision diagram of with one. And if you allow a little bit more with, you get a generalization of that greedy heuristic. So I like to think about restricted decision diagrams as a generalization of greedy heuristics. Um, Isaac writes, have you ever found experimentally that taking the intersection of nodes is worth the trade-off versus just picking the greediest arc? Uh, I, I actually, no, I think the, in my experience, the best way of building a restricted decision diagram is to just throw away nodes. And I think part of the reason for that is because some greedy measure generally works fairly well for heuristics. And also you're going to be maintaining a bunch of nodes. So for me, the thing that I found most effective is that you build it up to a layer as much as you can. When you get too large, throw away nodes and just continue iterating. Andre, do you have any other uh, comments or yeah. thoughts? About that? So, so yeah, uh, complementing the usually for the bound purpose is better to eliminate. There is one situation though, where we did some experiments a long time ago, and we noticed that when you take the intersection for the maximum set problem, you end up with many more solutions. The bound is worse and for that could be better, man, let's say maybe if you're using the DD to generate columns in a branching price approach. So I, I don't think people will explore that very much, but that could be useful still in terms of the bound, absolutely. And there are some other cases that uh, if you need more solutions in the DD for some reason, it could still be better. Yeah, I mean, what if, I love that. I love that, that comment. Thank you, Andre. What if you don't exactly know what your objective function is? But you want to build a pretty big diagram that when you get a new one, you can just find it very quickly, right? In that case, you might not just want to focus on one very good path being there in the end. You may want many, many solutions. So yeah, I can think of definitely reasons why you want to use the intersection or whatever the restriction operation would be. Knapsack, for example, you would take the maximum value. It just depends on the problem. For example, if you're learning your objective, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I think the, 
The next thing that's interesting is how you can use it for inference and structural properties. Um, we are getting a little bit tight on time. So I'm going to see what we can focus on moving forward. Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of different things one can now do with decision diagrams. What we showed you here is really kind of what we initially conceptualize it as, right, Andre? And I think, you know, John Hooker and his really kind of original work here, he did the constraint programming so originally and then got more into this optimization stuff. And I think there's people look at this problem and they start to attack the problems that they love with the methodology of DDs, which I love. And I think you can use it for cutting planes. You can use it for multi-objective optimization. You can use it for constraint programming. You can use it for a lot of other things. The What I have mostly focused my energy on in research on DDs in recent years is on DD-based decompositions. But given that this is a CP class, I do want to hop very quickly to the constraint programming section to give you a flavor of what can be done with um, with constraint program. And again, Andre and I will make uh, these slides available to you after this talk so that you can use it at least for reference. And of course, any questions at all, feel free to ping us at any point. So let's talk very briefly about constraint programming. And I actually only have a few minutes here. I have to give another talk, but Andre can maybe continue the conversation for a few minutes if needed. So in constraint programming, what do you have? You have a collection of variables, which typically have some finite domain. And you have constraints that are given to you in the form of global constraints often that have specifically tailored uh, filtering algorithms that allow you to figure out how to remove domain values. So suppose you have this system with these four variables and these domains. What you often do is you have a constraint like an all different, which says that all of the variables have to take different values for the variables that are in the support of that constraint. If you think about this and look at the system for a second, what you might notice is that if I look at node two, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, variable three and variable four, they both have domain two, three. And if we have four variables and you're requiring those four variables to all take different values, then you will see that two and three have to be assumed by the variables X3 and X4. And what you can do to make that inference is look at the variable value graph that you see here. You identify Hall sets. Willem has a very good uh, survey on all different constraints, which you can read. And what you see is that X3 and X4 are a collection of two variables that have domain contained in a size that equals the number of variables you have there. And so no other variable can take a value in that set. And there's a lot of different propagation algorithms and consistency notions in constraint programming. And so you can remove this, do a search, and find a solution to your problem. Now, let's go to a little bit of a bigger problem, a little bit more of a complex problem, and talk about how using decision diagrams I find to be a really promising approach to constraint programming. And one of the challenges in constraint programming is handling objective functions sometimes, because the way that you're representing a problem is not amenable to finding tight bounds. So suppose we have this problem on these four variables, and I have a little bit of a bigger domain, and you have an all different constraint, and also a simple linear inequality, which just says that x1 plus x2 plus x3 have to be greater than or equal to 9. If you stare at this problem for a, for a bit of time, and assuming I made no mistake, which is only an assumption, there is no value that can be removed from any of the domains of the variables. If you think about one of the constraints, each of the constraints at a time, and also, if you think about it just in the sense of the domain store that you have, the best bound that you therefore can get if you want to max minimize the sum of the variables is six. Now, of course, you also know x1 plus x2 plus x3 are greater than or equal to nine. So actually, that's, there's some things you can do. But really, if you just look at the domain store, the best bound you can get is six. The optimal value, by the way, is 11 by taking the solution three, one, two, five for variables x1, x2, x3, and x4. And what the original use of relaxed decision diagrams were for, at least in my understanding, in the world of optimization and constraint programming, was for a system where you would replace this kind of really, you know, coarse-grained representation of the domain store by a more refined decision diagram. And a decision diagram of with one will exactly represent the domain store through the projection of the values onto the variables. And so 
every path here, we've been focusing on binary optimization problems, but now we're going to talk about general discrete optimization problems. Every single path will correspond to a solution. So for example, the solution one, four, five, six is a valid way, valid solution. You get a solution value of 16. But of course, there will be paths here that are not feasible. For example, one, one, two, two, which is the best bound you can get if you don't do any other kind of inference. What a decision diagram allows us to do is to create a more refined look at what the domain store can look like. And the way that you do that, at least one of the ways that's been uh, suggested in the literature is through incremental refinement and filtering. And so suppose I were to take this, the node on the second layer and split it into, put some of the domain values of X1 on the left, some of the domain values on the right. And how you do that is of course, an active thing of research. But suppose that we decided to do this split. Without this split, I can't really remove one from the domain of one because actually there is a feasible solution with X1 equal to one. But with this split, I know I have an all different constraint, right? So if X1 is one, X2 cannot be one. So, and that's, and you can define this, it's very nicely put in a paper from 2007, I believe by, by, by Hooker and some of his colleagues. And what you do is you see that if I take one here, I can no longer take one. I do allow X2 to take one on this path, but it cannot happen here. So I can remove that value from the arc domain, not from the domain of the variable, but from this more refined representation. And now all of a sudden your shortest path would be seven, not six. But we can do even more. Suppose we were to split here. Well, if you take the longest path to this node, it's five. I know that X1 plus X2 plus X3 have to be greater than or equal to nine. And so if I add a two to that and I go down, I'm never gonna be able to make it up to the nine. So you can remove that value. Again, assuming I made no mistakes in the calculations. And what you see is by incrementally splitting nodes and filtering them based on the more refined information you can get based on this more generic way of representing the domain store, you get tighter and tighter bounds. And so one promising direction I feel is that you can use decision diagrams as a replacement for the domain store in constraint programming. And I think with that, I am going to conclude. Uh, of course, if people have questions, feel free to ask them. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. There is a hand up, I think. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the interesting talk. So I have I have a question. So you <clears throat> you described um, the relaxation point and and basically um, the restriction point for for obtaining bounds and, and getting um, good solutions. Is there is there anything that combines those? So I mean, for example, if you want to have a bound, then you can restrict on on those parts of the solution that you can somehow bound away or which are not very um, promising to basically um, um, no, no, not consider those, but restrict them. And this might result in smaller BDDs. Has this been done? Uh, there are some flavors of that. I don't know, Dave, if, uh, I, I see two flavors of that. There is the, some quasi-relaxations in the sense that you uh, you remove feasible solutions that you know is going to be able to be suboptimal, and then you just erase them. So there is one direction to do that. So then it's quasi-relaxation because the optimal solution value is preserved, but not the feasible sets. Right. And then uh, another way is if you give me a relaxation, I can do a greedy heuristic over the DDD just going through the paths that are feasible, which I think is close, somewhat close to what you're, you're mentioning. And it's a, it, they do that in the dynamic programming universe as well. It's called the greedy approach. You can also do that. And uh, so far, in terms of bound, has always been the best to build a separate restricted diagram and co constructing getting the bound by removing nodes from our experience. But it's something that is, uh, I have never seen published like that before, but something definitely that uh, it, it's viable. It's possible to. Yeah, okay. And, and my, other, my other question is, okay, let's say we, we just have, have a description of our problems in terms of linear inequalities. Right. Um, is there any way to, to build, to programmatically build somehow a good relaxation or some that, that does not completely suck? Like for the recursive formulations that we had for maximum independent set and, and so on? 
uh, there are a few ways that you can do that are often effectively practiced is you start, for example, let's suppose there is a case where all the coefficients are positive and variables, right? Let's suppose that you have one. So usually you take the, the linear inequality that is the tightest. You know, that again, this is very heuristic, okay? The uh, inequality that has the smallest right-hand side, for example, if it is all positive, so then you have a small diagram, you can reduce it, you can do different things. Then you start separating constraints one at a time. Take another constraint that is very tight, and then you modify the diagram to incorporate that other constraint. So usually this can give, and then you stop, for example, when you're the, with this large enough. So this, this could be a, a good way of building it. But again, uh, there is uh, some work by Christian, uh, it's hard for me to pronounce his surname, Shago made me know better, Tadahamna, Tadahamna. I, I can give you the link that shows some ideas on how to build them from general linear systems. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. And then uh, Quentin, also gonna talk tomorrow how you can use machine learning to find those bounds, to find the better relaxations. Any other questions? So if there are any questions, we're gonna start. Thanks so much for hanging on. We're gonna put this slides that are more references about genuine cutting planes, other things that you can do, okay? And let's take a, a quick break. Oh, sorry, just one question. Have you seen any work on using this sort of network design problems? Uh, no, the only thing that I saw is something that uh, David and I worked actually, which we use uh, the these to, to generate like what's the best possible relaxation that end up being a network design problem. But never, never, I have never seen that specifically, Matheus. It's a very good interest, good direction for network design problems, for sure. Network design and also some facility location problems. I think they are close and connected. There are some new works on unit commitment problems, which is something that Danielle is going to talk tomorrow, which I think is more close, it's closer to network design problems in that sense. So uh, I think tomorrow or, or on Wednesday, uh, Danielle is going to give some directions for those kinds of problems. Okay, great question. Any more questions? Okay, fantastic. So let's take a quick break. We're going to come back at uh, 12 30. I'm just going to again take more, more water. Let's keep us hydrated and Tiago is going to be our first speaker. Then we can go through more specifics of some topics in the scene diagrams. Uh, it's here. Yeah, it's going to be here. You don't need to leave the room. Just wait uh, 10, 12 minutes in this room, and then Tiago is going to start his amazing talk. OK, David? Tiago, I recommend going to make you a co-host. Then if you can see if you can share your screen and everything, would be great. OK. Tiago, you have all the power now. I'm gonna be back in a few seconds, okay? In a few, in one or two minutes, I'll be right back. Okay, I guess everyone is seeing the, the bigger slide or the slide control? It's good, Tiago. We see the bigger slide. Okay, thanks. <laughs> 